Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. You know, when it comes to indie cinema, less can quite often be more. And if you're within the sound of my voice, that must mean you are in the seats with once more. As always, my name is Dave Voigt, and I'm the host of this podcast, where we sit down with a wide-ranging variety of industry professionals, and we pick their brain about current projects, state of the industry, how they got started, and so very much more in a light and in a conversational fashion. And you know, if you like how we do things around here, I'm going to go out on a limb and assume that you do, because you're listening right now. Uh, you can subscribe to the podcast. Uh, give us that old like and subscribe. Give us a five-star rating, basically, wherever you get your podcasts. We're over at Apple, Amazon, Spotify, Google. We're pretty much everywhere. And plus, we archive every single one of our episodes over at our In The Seats YouTube channel. So if you can give us a like and subscribe there as well, we would absolutely appreciate it. Also, uh, don't hesitate to check us out on social media. We're on the Facebook. We're on the Twitter. And we're on the Instagram, as the kids call it. Uh, at what? where else would we be? We're at In The Seats. For all sorts of fun updates. And finally... And I do dare say, most importantly, please pay us a visit over at In The Seats, intheseats.ca, for all the latest and greatest from the world of television, film, basically the moving image at large. Because you know what? If we love to watch it and write about it and talk about it, we love it when you come by and read about it and listen about it. So please pay us a visit. We got a real interesting one on this one. We're diving diving into a little bit of indie cinema, which is having a limited theatrical run in the States right now, and it's coming to video on demand imminently, I believe, next week, but we'll double-check on that for you. But it's called uh, Silent River, and it's an interesting little film that had uh, a great little festival run, and it's now uh, getting out, out there into the world, and it's the story of Elliot, uh, who is desperate to reconcile with his estranged wife, Julie, and determined he, he gets in the car and drives across a barren desert road uh, to reach her and hoping he can convince her to give him a second chance. But when he stops at a roadside motel, he, he reaches out to a surprised Julie, who informs him, you know, it's done, she's moved on. And while he's at a loss for his next move, Elliot falls into a downward spiral and he's depressed. And this is when he encounters the sultry Greta, uh, an uncanny woman who's on the run from a mysterious past. And then when he meets her, all these strange and mysterious occurrences begin to start haunting him. And as the shadowy line between reality and dark fantasy become increasingly blurred, Elliot ultimately questions his own sanity and seeks the truth. But at the end of the day, will he regret finding the answer? It's, uh, it's like, no, it's basically, this is, it's a thriller, but it's a little bit of no-budget sci-fi as well. Uh, it's one of those movies that gets you talking, it gets you discussing. It really has some interesting themes going on in it as well. And it is from writer-director uh, Chris Chan Lee, who we had the unique pleasure of sitting down and talking with uh, about uh, this film, and so very much more. But, uh, like I said, go check out Silent River, either... Uh, in theaters now, or on video on demand, uh, imminently, which, uh, I believe, like I said, is the 25th, yeah, it's, I am pretty sure it's the 25th, it's 25th of Tuesday, I am babbling, but we will, yeah, the 25th is a Tuesday, so I'm pretty sure this is going to be on all video on demand platforms on October 25th, but enjoy that, enjoy Silent River, but first enjoy our talk with Chris, because, uh, between you and me, it's a pretty good one. Yeah. I mean, just to kick it off officially, man, just again, like, thank you for the time today. And I mean, congratulations on the movie, man. I absolutely loved it. Uh, thanks, David. Um, yeah, we're really excited because uh, our in two days is our theatrical premiere. Um, we've been screening the film for almost actually about a year on the festival circuit. So we've had a lot of screenings. We're lucky that most of them were in person. Um, but it's a big milestone for us in a couple of days to have an actual commercial release. That's fantastic, man. Followed by our DVD, our VOD, which is in October 25th. Yeah. No, I mean, I guess walk me through sort of the origin of the story on your end. The making of the film? Well, and... just the main, like the idea for the film, basically. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I've been a filmmaker for a while now my first feature came out in 1997 as a writer director i've directed some other films i've done i also i've worked a lot in other capacities blah 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 um so a few years ago i was really hunger hungry to make my third feature and i have a lot of scripts in development a lot of things that 
uh, a lot of dream projects that I would like to get done at some point. But, you know, most of them require a significant number of a significant amount of resources. Right. Right. So I was getting tired of waiting around, you know, to get permission, essentially, to make a movie. And I wanted to make something that I could do at a low bar in terms of resources yet that could still be a very ambitious project that would let me sort of explore where I'm at right now as a creative person, as a storyteller, et cetera, you know? So silent river was done at a very low budget, but, um, but it doesn't mean that we weren't trying to be ambitious. We really tried to hit it out of the park and do something unique that whatever the budget is, is irrelevant because it's a film that only our team could have made, you know, with a very, personal outlook style uh, a, pers a a very specific vocabulary that we came up with uh in telling the story and creating the world it really felt like in watching it that this was the kind of film that when you're when you're going out for people to to cast it and put it together you almost need to pitch them the whole sort of concept of what you're trying to do and have them sort of embrace that as well as just as the part as well. Can you walk me through your sort of your casting process to find the right people for this project? Well, very early on, I wanted to work with the lead actor, West Liang, and he's also a producer on the film. And we wanted to collaborate on something. And, um, and we had access to this hotel and we had some other actors in mind, like one of the other leads, Max Fogno, I'd worked with on my previous film, Undoing, that was a feature I wrote and directed. We cast Max in that movie, but we were never never able to get to his scene or his character. He had a supporting right. role in Undoing. So we never shot him at all. But I still remembered what a great actor he is and also what a pleasure it was to work with him, to almost work with him and stuff like that, you know? So years later... I dug him up and we called upon him and he read with the other actors. He read with Amy and with uh, with West. Amy Sang plays the female lead of our film, uh, Greta, as well as Julie. She plays a dual role and she's also the costume designer. Anyways, the three of them as the co-leads of the film really had the right chemistry and even kind of like physical chemistry and everything, you know, so it worked out. Um, it was really like identifying the resources we had, the, the good talent that we had that that made themselves available for the project. And then I knew I had this hotel, so I had some ideas for relationships and characters. And I basically reverse engineered the story okay. from the hotel to the people that we had, you know, to our to the ideas that me and the director of photography, Norbert Shea, had and um, just reverse engineered it, and, like started at the hotel, making lots of floor plans measuring things, taking photographs, and then writing a story during that kind of tech scouting process, you know. Very cool. Very cool. Now, I mean, something I appreciated about your film, to be honest, is because, I mean, when we get sort of science fiction films that are obviously working on a budget, sometimes a lot of them will try to shoehorn in that one visual effect that kind of takes you out of the movie because it doesn't look very good. You did not do that, and I appreciate you for doing that. How important was it for you to tell a very sort of thoughtful and engaging and really contemplative piece of science fiction, but inside the universe that you had of this hotel and not try to sort of shoehorn anything in that wasn't going to belong. Thanks, Dave. Well, that was certainly part of the challenge. And we were lucky to have our VFX supervisor, Jared Potter, um, you know, overseeing all those things. And, and one of the things that Jared and I talked about from the get go was yeah exactly we didn't want the effects to overshadow the scenes or to take away from the genuine feeling of things actually happening to and with the characters we wanted it to to be organic you know so we literally used some aesthetic um elements that are inherently a part of the visual execution of the film you know a lot of it a lot of what jared did is related to nature like tree branches right. and um, and rocks and stone and, and things that are part of like the desert terrain. Um, and that's, that was, that was kind of the approach that we took. And, you know, I would say over half the effects you don't even really see. Yeah. Like we, we, we cleaned up, we used them to clean things up to separate the characters in their color palette from the backgrounds and stuff like that. So most of it is not actually not visibly uh, identifiable, but there are, there is a few things that are more overt and we were very careful about it. 
Did you get a lot of rehearsal time? I mean, obviously, you know, West and Amy are are, are more invested than, say, your standard actors because they have different jobs as well. But it's definitely the kind of of project where it feels like you can't be exploring things when you're out there shooting. You, everyone sort of has to be 100% on the same page before yeah. you get to the hotel. Yeah, there isn't, there was very little rehearsal time. Um, you know, we did a lot of read throughs of of the heavier dialogue scenes and stuff like that to sort of explore the ear of the scene and things right but but you know also i'm not like a big i'm not really big on rehearsals anyway of course there is a practical reason here we just didn't have time to do a lot of things right um but i i do work off my intuition of getting a sense of if the actors have a strong understanding of what's going on if me and the DP have a good game plan of how we're going to break down the scene. And I, I just, I build up that sense of like, well, are people ready? Do they know just enough about it to be, to have a little bit of that healthy tension, right? Of like, well, how is it going to actually be executed? Or what are we going to discover when we actually start rolling camera, et cetera? You, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty and I think that's a good thing. But I also, we also have things very carefully planned in the background. So we're sort of ready. We have contingencies for things that may or may not happen on set. Now, how, Ben, you mentioned this before, but I mean, I do love the visual style of the film as well. And I mean, in many ways, it felt like a type of purgatory that these characters were kind of existing in. And I mean, how did you go about sort of crafting something like that with your DB, DP? Because I mean, obviously, on one end, you're in a hotel, or you're, you're just outside, but you're creating like a slight shift to what is already reality kind of thing, at least from my perspective. Exactly, Dave. I mean, that was the hope was, you know, we're making a small indie film, but we're not bound by imagination. And and let's really explore how, you know, other worlds, let's, let's, let's world build and try to do something um, that isn't ordinary, you know, that's unique. And Purgatory was a concept that, we uh, we worked around and with because you know as you could see in the film we're pulling as a framework from a lot of greek mythology and things like that so so we wanted to be able to create this uh, this other experience for the viewer because that's that's the fun of arts the arts and cinema and all that is is to create something that people can uniquely experience um so that that yeah that was the idea was this this transitional purgatory world or 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 in a sense like a prison for Elliot who could could not get away from his trappings of the physical world you know what is it about science fiction that I mean no matter what your budget that allows for the freedom to to tell like to sort of express very complex ideas inside a story because I mean you can't put the bent that you have in this film and apply it to like a rom-com kind of thing. Like it needs exactly. to be sort of that sort of existential science fiction kind of world. What is it about that that makes these ideas work so well? Exactly, Dave. It, it's a little bit of a dance, right? Like, like I, I, I had to do research the background, the framework of the story um, and have my own sense of why things were happening my own logic to the sort of illogical imaginary world, right? Or or this world that had different laws of physics that are not, that don't correlate to like where you and I are right now. Um, but at the same time, it's a dance because you want to create a sense that things are not, uh, that things are, are, you know, are there for a reason and it's not just arbitrary, uh, but you also want to unlock the viewer, the imagination and the viewer and like make them confident in the, the the laws of the world that you're creating. But also it's bit more about the power of suggestion than just nailing things down because then that that stops the imagination, right? So we're trying to like open up possibilities with this world that we're suggesting in the film and to be consistent enough with the vocabulary as i mentioned before so that you that you felt like you're in good hands during the telling of the story no and you're absolutely right because i mean this is the kind of film that will spark conversation after the fact and it's just and that's really at the end of the day isn't that what art's supposed to be about to sort of yeah exactly we hope so like i i could sit next to you and and some of the other uh leads on the the key key role roles on the film everyone has their own explanation of why things are happening on screen and why certain choices were made and stuff 
But ultimately, we realize that that's futile, that we want the audience to sort of take ownership of the experience and to have their own interpretation. And everyone's going to bring their own viewpoint and and, look, and baggage, I should say, maybe, to to the film. So, um, so our job is really, yeah, to be cohesive and consistent um, and, and hopefully make the audience care enough that they want to interpret what they're seeing, you know. What's the first film you saw as a younger man that, maybe had the light bulb go off for you and made you want to get into this business that had sort of similar ideas to this that made you want to sort of question what was going on and really sort of partake more in the conversation of what was happening in the story as opposed to sort of trying to define what the story was. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I at first I thought I was going to get into computer science and programming and all that, but I was always into the visual arts and everything. And really the the, the aha moment, Dave, was when, um, I went to a movie theater in San Francisco. It was nearly empty. <clears throat> Excuse me, a nearly empty music theater, and they were playing a uh, uh, movie theater, and they were playing David Lynch's Blue Velvet. And nice. it was one of those things where you never—I didn't really hear anything about the movies. Somehow, you know, I mean, I know it made a big impact even when it, right when it came out, but I guess I saw it when it was already playing for a while. I didn't hear anything about it. I just went to go see it. And that really blew my mind what David Lynch created, you know, this this other world that he transported you to. And that made me want to become a filmmaker, you know. And and since then, I've, of course, I've watched a lot more world cinema and, and historic film and stuff like that and have been exposed to lots of other things. But But David Lynch was a huge inspiration from the get go. Well, you know, I mean, Chris, after watching this movie, I mean, I definitely think there is someone out there who, I mean, and hopefully they don't see it in an empty movie theater, they see it in a full movie theater, but can have that kind of lynching experience after seeing this film, because it's definitely got that kind of vibe, and it's a hell of a piece of work, and I just want to say thank you so much for the time today, and again, congratulations on the film. Thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. And if anyone can, we're we're available on uh, Apple iTunes. Right now, it's pre-order. We go wide on VOD October 25th. The film is Silent River. You can find us at silentrivermovie.com and um, also on Instagram and Facebook, et cetera. Thank you so much, Dave. Really appreciate you having us on. Got to support indie cinema and absolutely right, Ben. But again, congratulations on the film and I mean, good luck. And don't forget to, to visit our friends over at Bay Street Video for all your DVD, Blu-ray rental or purchasing needs this summer as they are still open for curbside and some mailing delivery as well. Over at 1172 Bay Street, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, you can give them a call at 416-964-9088. That's 416-964-9088. Or send them an email at baystreetvideoto at gmail.com for any of your DVD and Blu-ray needs. <laughs>